to focus on this afternoon is behavioral treatment of sleep. Now that you have some of the context for why children with autism don't sleep well, what the causes are, what the medical issues are, how to partner with your um, provider, and um, talk about the concepts of sleep education, how do we implement them from toolkits to books to formal sessions, uh, get your input on that, and then invite parents and therapists to share their questionnaires, uh, <laughs> grandparents, other relatives as well, and design a, a behavioral program. So I want to start out with this quote by Lucy Wigg. She actually wrote not about autism, but about intellectual disabilities. And um, it's really been a profound quote for me, and I've used it a lot in my talks and in talking with parents, uh, behavioral treatment of sleep problems in children with intellectual disabilities and challenging daytime behavior reduces parent stress, increases parent satisfaction with their own sleep, their child's sleep, and heightens their sense of control and ability to cope with their child's sleep. And I really believe this is true in my practice, and, and I've watched families who, sure, if they give their child a pill or melatonin or whatever, and their child is sleeping better, that's great. Everybody's happy. But I've really been impressed with the families who, when they've implemented a behavioral intervention for sleep, and come back and told me, wow, this is amazing. My child is sleeping for the first time in years. And I'm, I'm looking at this, uh, one, of the, one of the families who was in our um, parent sleep education research program that I'll tell you about at the end was at um, the University of Colorado. And she gave a quote for our book. And she wrote, the picture schedule worked like a miracle the very first night. And my daughter fell asleep in minutes rather than hours. And it was, it was more than just the sleep improving, which is huge in and of itself. It was the family's sense of um, confidence and competence with their own sleep and their ability to parent their child. In fact, we used the parenting sense of competence scale, which measures a parent's uh, feelings about how effective they are as a parent and how satisfied they are as a parent in our research study and showed that improved, that, that scale improved with parent sleep education. So I think we're, we're giving not only the gift of sleep to the children with autism when we help their parents, but we're actually helping the parents. And as I said earlier this morning, when you help the family and you help the parents, you're not only helping the parents, but you're helping the whole family. You're helping the children, because if the parents are calm, the children will be calm. If they're better slept, they'll be able to be better advocates for their, their children. So anyway, I just wanted to elaborate on this quote, because I think it is really meaningful and significant. So I'm going to talk about a case, uh, and we can walk through what we did for Mikey, but um, I want to just present it. And, and before we even get into the uh, specifics of behavioral sleep education, see how much you guys already know. Mikey is a six-year-old boy with autism and insomnia. He enjoys a glass of Mountain Dew with dinner. And he recently got an iPad for his birthday on which he plays this very stimulating video game that many of you have probably heard of called Angry Birds, although it could also be Flappy Bird or some of these other uh, games that are going around. He goes to bed at 8 p.m. He has difficulty initiating sleep. He'll often sing songs from his video games, including the Angry Birds one, for one to two hours before falling asleep, driving his whole family nuts, of course. <laughs> And he'll, overly, he'll be overly active during the day. He's always on the go. His parents are exhausted. His mother has started sleeping with him so that the family can sleep. So before we even get into the details, um, would people like to volunteer what maybe we can do to help Mikey fall asleep or what some of the issues are here? Yeah, go ahead. No Mountain Dew. No Mountain Dew. Good idea. What's that? Mm-hmm. 
No Mountain Dew and no iPad. What else? Yeah, so could we change the game on the iPad? That would certainly help. As we talked about this morning, we still have the, the light issue and the stimulating issue, but I agree, that, that would help a lot. Um, particularly, maybe do a matching game after dinner so he still has some computer time, but then turn off the electronics an hour before. Other things? There's something else on here that I haven't spent that much time talking about. I did mention it this morning, though. Child, uh, the mother sleeping with the child? Well, the mother sleeping with the child, I think we mentioned this morning, even though there are cultural preferences for co-sleeping, in the majority of kids that I've seen, um, the parents are sleeping out of necessity, the, the child waking up, worrying about it being a safety issue. Um, but there's something else about the, the sleep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The 8 p.m. bedtime may actually be too early for him, and I'm going to show you a slide on that. Yeah? Changing the bedtime routine from being the games to being something quieter? Yes, exactly. So not only taking away the stimulating video, but substituting something that's more calming. Excellent. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You make a very good point. The idea of engaging in, in something purposeful, heavy work, exercise during the day. So daytime habits can be as important as evening habits. It's excellent. Um, I'm going to have nothing to say by the time we're done. <laughs> Go ahead. Right, the, the idea that this, this video game is not only stimulating, it's resulting in his having this kind of repetitive behavior, the sing-songing, that could then interfere with sleep, not to mention the rest of the family's sleep. Yeah, excellent. Good. Well, this is a really good start, and I want to walk through a lot of what we've just talked about in a little more detail now. So. Um, components of successful sleep. So as we heard, it's not just what happens at bedtime, it's what happens throughout the day. So daytime habits, evening habits, the sleep environment, bedtime routines are all really important. And sleep hygiene, you may have heard that term, is used to describe a, day, a person's daytime and evening habits that contribute to successful sleep. So they're all important. And we, one of the um, questionnaires in your book is the family inventory of sleep habits. And we developed this um, to use in our research, but we've really used it practically as well. This is the research version, which is 12 questions. It's short. Uh, we can use it to, um, to measure change with interventions. Um, but the longer version in your booklet is, asks about even more questions. And we use it to identify areas, not just at night, but during the day, where the families uh, can make improvements. It's, it's tricky because when you first look at it, you're like, well, a family knows, you know, that it's, it's, it, they know that they're supposed to fill it out a certain way, right? I mean, my child gets exercise during the day. You're probably not supposed to write never, right? But on the other hand, it is a really valuable tool, given that. I mean, we don't necessarily use this to say, well, they've definitely improved and the child should be sleeping better because they went from saying the child never exercises to usually exercises because we, there still may be an element of the parent knowing how to fill it out. But it, it is really, really helpful, I think, uh, for a busy clinician or a parent to be able to just take an inventory and say these are the areas that I can work in. So uh, we use it in that way and we use it to say when I, when I show you my behavioral sleep education program, it's, 
it's, it's a, we try to do everything in an hour with, with the families and we've, we've shown that that's been very successful, but it's very individualized. So in other words, this is a way of making it individualized. This is a way of being able to say to the family, let's look at this and focus on the areas that your child needs the most help on. This is a way of saying to the therapist or the nurse or whoever's providing the behavioral sleep education, this is a way of targeting the areas in your limited time with the family, and you have limited time, and they have limited time. Where's the money? And if, if, if you get a response like, uh, in the hour before bedtime, my child engages in exciting and stimulating activities, usually it could be a great opportunity to educate the family and come up with you know, more, more bedtime appropriate activities. So, so this is how we use it. And we'll talk about more when we, um, we invite one of you up to, to go through this. And then the daytime habits, uh, which are covered on the, on the family inventory of sleep habits, include abundant exercise, abundant light, limiting caffeine, limiting naps, limiting the bedroom to um, not doing timeouts in the bedroom, not having a computer or a TV in the bedroom. It's not always possible if it's a small house or um, there's only so much space in the house. Sometimes you do have to have the child's computer or TV in the bedroom. Um, maybe not TV, maybe that could be in a family room, but let's say they need a computer for schoolwork. Um, but what you can do is you could say goodnight to the computer. You could put a sheet over the computer at bedtime, or if they have a laptop or an iPad, it can go into a certain part of the, the house. And the idea is the less they use that device in their actual bedroom, and hopefully never in the bed, they won't associate the bed and the bedroom with that device. So let me give you an example from my adult clinic. I had an accountant as an insomnia patient. She didn't have autism, she was, a, she was an adult, but it's a good example, I think, to illustrate this kind of learning to associate the bed and the bedroom with something that isn't promoting sleep. So she was an accountant, and for fun, I guess, and to relax, she would uh, balance her checkbook when she was in bed at night before she went to sleep. Maybe that's why I'm not an accountant, I don't know. <laughs> but that's what she did. And she would wake up, have trouble falling asleep, wake up sometimes thinking about numbers, and she had basically associated the checkbook balancing with her bed. So that's what you don't want to do, and that's why the timeout should be in a different room if you're going to use that with your child as, as a form of discipline. Your um, TVs, your homework, everything else, you want to try to move out of the bed. So that's what the selected bedroom use is about. Evening habits, limiting, limiting stimulating activities, TV videos. I love this book, Good Night iPad. It's, it's a spoof on Good Night Moon, and it's written by Android. <laughs> it's actually really funny. They have a big electrical outlet, and they have, a, you know, they have all sorts of interesting things in it. So it's, it's very funny. But... Um, it, it really is a good illustration of needing to say goodnight to the iPad and the tablets and dimming the light, because we talked earlier this morning about how light can suppress natural melatonin, and putting these routines into place. And one of the really neat things about kids with autism is many of them crave routine, and you can use that to your advantage in implementing a bedtime uh, strategy. And then the sleep environment. And this is where it may be counterintuitive. You know, you might think, well, you know, cool temperature, good textures, but sound should be minimal. It should be as quiet as possible. And light should be minimal, but not always. So you really want to individualize it. So my son, for example, uh, was very anxious, and would get very anxious if we closed the door, the room was pitch black, there were no sounds he would really start freaking out. So what we found was if we left the door open and he could, a little bit, and he could hear the sounds from the house drifting up to his bedroom, if we had a night light, it made a tremendous difference because then he felt more comfortable um, than if it were completely pitch black and quiet. So really individualizing the environment 
uh, to what works and, and playing around with it. The other thing that works really well is a dimmer switch. So a child who's used to having the light on because they're scared, if you just like turn off the light, it's not going to work. But if you could put in a dimmer switch and very, very gradually every night dim the, the, just a little bit, that can be very effective in, in promoting um, a, a, a dimmer environment.